come this morning to Rango Heights. It's a beautiful and beautiful morning. It's good to have everybody for worship. Um, we're going to worship this morning uh, with a hymn. Uh, we're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Yeah, Again, it's uh, good to see everyone here this morning. Um, again, it's a beautiful day. Uh, we got several announcements we want to make. Uh, business meeting coming up this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, youth will be meeting upstairs in the youth room. Uh, we got Bible school coming out, come up in June, the 21st to 25th. We still need supplies for that. We still need a few jars. If anybody's interested in signing up to be a leader or just just helping out in general there's a sign up list over here that you can sign up to help with that um, there will be a movie night for the youth on june 6th starting at 5 30. we uh, also i think that's about all the announcements i have anybody else have anything else to add okay um we have many people on our prayer list. Uh, we want to be in prayer for the nation of Israel, um, be, in, be in prayer for the situation there, that this will be resolved. Uh, we want to be in prayer for our nation. There's lots of things going on with our nation today. We want to be in prayer for our families and our nation, be in prayer for um, our president. We may not agree with him sometimes, but we want to be in prayer for our leaders our governors, uh, just be in prayer for 
just our schools. School may be winding down, but we would be when we want to be in prayer for everyone that's leading our children, our families, and our churches. Um, to be with everyone that's on our prayer list here. Um, and be in prayer for, I'm just going to mention this, be in prayer for my father. He's having surgery tomorrow. I'm just eye surgery. He should be in and out real quick, but be in prayer for him. Uh, anybody ever have any special needs that they want to mention this morning? If not, we'll go to God in prayer. We'll mention this and we to, to reach out to him this morning. God, we, we come to you this morning with great hearts, Lord. There are, there are so many, Lord, that have not been mentioned, Lord. But, Lord, we come to you because you told us to do that, to act obediently and faithfully. And before we pray for each of these things that we mentioned this morning, God, we just pray that you have your hand upon each one of these things. We pray for the nation of Israel, Lord. We pray that you provide peace there. We pray for our nation, God. We pray that you will, you will come down upon this nation, Lord, that you will just provide for you. We will remove, Lord, this plague of sins as upon our land. We pray that your church will rise up again. The gospel will begin to be preached. Lord, we just pray that you will be our families, Lord. That you will just begin to move in our families in a way that will just draw them back from the church. Father, we just pray that you be with those that are sick. There are so many, Lord. Be with them, God. Lift them up, God. Provide comfort where comfort is needed. Healing, Lord, where it is needed. Lord, you see our prayer this morning, and it's so long. We just pray that you touch it. God, we just pray so heavily for each one of these, God. We thank you for all you're doing. We just pray that for this church, Lord, that it can be an instrument in this community to draw others to need healing in brokenness. And we pray these things, Lord, in your Son's name. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing. to God is so good.
Um, if we have any children that are not already over, we're going to head on over to Children's Church. Amen. And it is it's good to be here, to have the opportunity to share God's Word. Um, this came up a couple weeks ago that I was going to get to do this, and it's interesting that this song was picked. God is so good. God is good. And many of us kind of testify to this in our lives. We've gone, many of us have gone through so much. And even through this pandemic, we can acknowledge that God is good. A.W. Tozer wrote, though, that a whole generation of Christians has come up believing that it is possible to accept Christ without forsaking the world. What good is that, though? When we look at the world and we see how good God is, yet a whole generation does not acknowledge the goodness of God. So my question for us today is, who truly is good? What is good? I asked this of my youth earlier when we met for Sunday school. What, what is good? What does good mean? Like, if I ask you, how are you doing today? You're going to say, I'm good. Or if I ask you, how was the meal you had yesterday at the restaurant or the day before at the restaurant? You're saying, well, it's good. But what does good mean? What is good? How, what, what does good mean? I want to look at that today. What, who is good? We looked at Last week we had Mother's Day, and we looked, many of us may have looked at the virtuous woman. To be good means to be virtuous, to be moral, to take on something that is beyond ourselves, to compare ourselves to something outside of ourselves and be that. But the world has started to take on a standard that is beyond a godly standard. So that today, for us who are believers, I want us to examine what are we comparing ourselves to? For us, for anyone who is here that is an unbeliever, I want you to stop and look. Are you, are you comparing yourself to the world or to God? If you've ever, any of you who've had toddlers in your life, you know that a toddler can be an angel sometimes, and a toddler can be a demon sometimes. <laughs> they can be good, or they can be downright a demon. So they, they, they can be both. But what does it mean to be truly good? You know, our measure of goodness can only be determined by our level of obedience and faithfulness to God and His commands. So I want to take us all back to where all this began and examine this in Scripture. So if you've got your Bibles, let's begin in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. At this point, God remedies the one thing that was not good in his creation. And that was for man to not be alone. And he made a helper for him. God saw something that was not good in his creation. 
So in verses 22 to 21, he says, So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and, and closed up its face with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. One of my, one of my former pastors says that one of the reasons that it's man and woman was because when Adam looked at the woman, he said, whoa, man. <laughs> That, that's the reason that we have woman and man. Um, at this point, man and woman dwell together in the garden in peaceful tranquility with God until some unexpected events arise in the course of the decisions of their lives, which ultimately separate them and separates us today from God. Now, I want to take it back just, just before this happened. Sometime within the final acts of creation, there must have been a fall of the evil angels that had occurred with Satan as the leading conspirator emerging as the evil intruder in Genesis 3, as we begin to go into chapter 3. It begins an earthly, it, it begins with this paradise, and they, and they twist the words of God to bring Adam and Eve under his rule. Evil entered the garden and paradise was lost. The serpent questions God's authority using confusion to lure Eve toward disobedience. The, the very name serpent describes the subtlety, craftiness, and the guiling nature that he uses to draw them away from God. And like a subtle snake, or destructive dragon. He wants to devastate God and his people today. He not only seeks to re retain souls of unbelievers, but he seeks to destroy the witness and reputation of his believers in the church. He's wanting to distract us. He doesn't he didn't want these things to be filled. He doesn't want children to be brought to Bible school. He doesn't want children to be in children's church. Why? Because if they are, if they grow in discipleship, they'll tell someone else. Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5 says, The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The Lord God had made. The Lord created the serpent. The the serpent had fallen. The serpent had rejected God. And he, the serpent, he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall eat of the, of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, let you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For, the God, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, compare the Lord, compare the command that the Lord uh, gave to Adam regarding the tree. He said to Adam, Eat of any tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge you shall not eat or die. But he said to Eve, and it echoes this a little bit, he says, her, he, to her he says, you shall, eat, you shall not eat of the tree, but she adds to this, you shall not touch it. There's a little bit of discrepancy there. She fails to acknowledge an, an awareness of good and evil. A lot of people know about Christ today. A lot of people know about God today. But there's no awareness of good and evil in their lives. There's no standard in their life. So what is good? What is truly good? 
Because this covenant was made with Adam before she was created, one might simply say there was just a miscommunication. Maybe he didn't tell her. Maybe she, view, maybe she views God's instruction as open to human modification. A lot of people do that today. They take God's, God's word, they take the law, they make it their, into their own interpretation. Maybe that's what he did. Or maybe one may consider it from the Jewish perspective. Eve may not have wanted to get to the point where they were close to disobeying God's command, and they set up this fence that would keep them a few steps removed from being tempted. Even this, Eve, in this case, could not eat from the tree, and also feeling that she could not touch it, and the prohibition from keeping her touch it, she put up a, a fence in her life. It's like going on a diet. You don't want to eat Debbie Cakes, you don't buy Debbie Cakes. But then somebody, you go into somebody's house and they got Debbie Cakes and you're tempted. You know, that, that kind of thing. So she says, she says to the serpent, we're not supposed to touch it. She was aware of her limits before God and had established boundaries, yet she was still vulnerable. We all know our vulnerabilities. And we have to be aware of what Satan and his demons are going to come at us with. That and in our families. And we have to be willing to go after those things and keep those fences in our life. It's this prohibition and this boundary toward recognized sin of any kind which our lives must learn to build fences around when we face temptation. Times and conditions may change. Types of sin may vary. But Satan's methods remain the same. He uses the familiar to foster disobedience and doubt toward God. But just as he did with Eve, eventually he convinces the self that his truth is right. And this is what the devil has done across our globe, across our nation. And God has lied. That's what he tells us. God has lied to you. God is, God's truth is not relevant anymore. This is what the devil has done everywhere. The enemy, Satan, and his demons will always use what is most familiar. Those things, those people that one is most familiar to allure one away from God toward pride, self-righteousness, sin, anything which will keep you from serving and acknowledging God as Lord in your life. Adam and Eve would have been familiar with the serpent among many creatures in the garden. So Eve would not have been in awe of this serpent. It would have just been one more snake to her. Some of the things that draw one toward temptation are sin and, and those things that we just take for granted. What is necessary is recognizing those areas in one's life where temptation and sin are greatest in order to discipline oneself to create that boundary that we need to not go near it. The serpent's dialogue with Eve suggests that God's likeness could be achieved through defiance of his command, suggesting that what Satan saw was not in God's character, but his power. Satan implied man could make himself equal to God if he would just seek knowledge. Verses 6 through 7 in chapter 3 says, The woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a light to the eyes, and that the tree to be desired uh, would make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The serpent led Eve to disobey God's command to refrain from the tree. She now had decided for herself that the tree was good for food and a delight to her eyes. 
the tree was to, to be desired to make one wise. She also gave some to Adam, who apparently did not think twice about accepting it. Alan P. Roth stated, This is the lie that has allured the human race from the beginning, that there is no punishment for disobedience. Yet the Bible makes it clear, disobedience will bring death. We've forgotten the consequence of disobedience to God. We don't want to tell anybody that there's hell. We don't want to tell anybody that, yes, God loves you, but if you reject him, you're going to hell. We, we forget that message, that God is love, that God is wrathful. There is a consequence to God's rejection. That, that is the message, too. Their response indicated a desire to be, become divinely all-knowing all while be, being led by a subordinate creature. And they were created in God's image as every individual today is. Every family is consecrated to be in the image of Christ. The serpent's dialogue with Eve suggests that God's likeness could be achieved through defiance of his command, suggesting what Satan saw was not in God's character, but his power. Satan was seeking to be over God. And he thought he could convince Adam and Eve to be like God and, God and be over God themselves. Satan implied man could make himself equal to God if he would just seek knowledge. After the consequence of disobedience is revealed, Satan allows the truth of God to be revealed as he already as he has already got them in his snares. You ever committed a sin and then you realize, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That's what Satan does to you. You put guilt in your life. Like, oh, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that. That's what Satan does. Yes, it's the Holy, sometimes it's the Holy Spirit, but sometimes Satan does that. He lets you know you've done wrong. Satan lets you know. He just puts deliberate guilt in your life. And yes, it's the Holy, if you're a Christian, it's the Holy Spirit. But Satan will just let you know and just guilt you, guilt you, guilt you to the point that you just brought down and eventually sometimes even depressed that you need, you just got to go to Christ. Satan will continue to seek individuals and families to act independently apart from God as he succeeded to do with Eve and Adam. He let them know that they had sinned. They knew they were naked. They knew they were apart from God. The warning for us today is recognition of these personal mistakes, to repent of those mistakes and commit to obey going forward. Eve failed to take seriously God's promise of punishment, and the serpent took advantage of this character flaw. We think we've got it all together. We think we're good. We live in a society today that fails to take seriously God's promise of punishment. We have allowed the watering down of the gospel and the manipulation of truth so others will be drawn to us rather than reminding others of their sin so that they might be drawn to God himself. We want others to come to us. We don't want to remind them that they need God. They need salvation. Scripture reveals each of us will wrestle with three primary enemies, which include the flesh, the influences of the world, and Satan himself. But because Satan is not omnipresent, Satan will use his demons and his followers to influence this world and the flesh to tempt others towards sin, knowing he cannot win the overall war. But he is inclined to win every battle that he can and every soul that he can. He's going to distract you. He's going to move you away from whatever he can to keep you from growing in discipleship, to keep your faith from growing. To keep your, your kids and your grandkids and your friends 
keep them away from knowing that you're a Christian and knowing that they need God. Eve then Adam succumbed to the serpent's temptation to be like God. Believers in God's family cannot make this assumption. We are called to be the children of God, fulfilling the great commission of Christ. When one fails to act faithfully and obediently to the word of God and follow the word which became flesh, it compromises one's ability to effectively fulfill his commission. For the believer, there is no option to do things my way or our way. It is about seeking to do his will and obey his commands. Judgment and condemnation follow man because of the choice that was made here. Romans 5.12 states, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Unbelievers in this world have determined, like Eve and Adam, to determine their, all, their own truth. To make their own set of rules. Live their own strength to create their own happiness. While the goal may be happiness, this is only, mo this is only a momentary feeling, which is never guaranteed and is not a right toward anyone. The understanding that absolute truths are to be the guiding principles which guide all man has been lost in society. We used to be a society and a civilization that was guided by absolute truth. By a God that set up truth to point us in one direction. These principles were founded on Judeo-Christian laws and the basic precepts for society and individual interaction. The issue comes when man makes the choice to, re to reject those truths for personally created truths and demanding everyone else fall in line. I've got my truth, you've got to do it my way. It can't be that way. There is one truth, and it's found in him. This is the truth, and all truth is set around this. We cannot live in a world where seven billion people are trying to create their own truth. Someone's going to get their feelings hurt, and sin will continue to separate man from God unless there is an unfailing and reliant absolute truth which we have in God himself in his word and it is to be the message of his church Paul reminds Timothy hold fast in carrying out the gospel message and that times will be hard he reminds us that in 2 Timothy 4 where he says for the time will come when people will not endure sound teaching, but they will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from the listening to the truth and wander into myths. Does that sound like our society today? A society that will go any way that they want except the way of God? We need to, our church needs to rise up. We need to pray that our, our church will come together and renew and repent and come back to God. He says, they will, they will fall into mid, wander into mid. As for you, he's talking to Timothy, always be sober minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Timothy, the young preacher, he's, he's talking to him as he goes out to do the mission of the gospel. But we're all missionaries. Every one of us called as Christians, believers. We are all missionaries. We all have our mission field. And so Jesus tells us what that truth is. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do not know him. 
you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is that way. That is our message. He is our truth. He is our mission. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. That second part of that just strikes me. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. To look, to look at the cross and see that what, what Christ did for us, and to, to think that we're, someone can reject that. But Christ acknowledges there will be those that will reject the cross. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. There are those that will create their own truth and will reject that cross. Believers or unbelievers cannot look to this world for personal happiness or contentment. Because this will be fleeting. It's only temporary. Only the peace of God will plant the seed of real happiness. You will be disappointed and let down and possibly hurt every time with anything else. Find peace in knowing that there is one who is still in control and has already provided victory. Who mends our brokenness. I'm reminded with that of a a song by Matthew West called Truth Be Told. Truth Be Told. He says, I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken. And when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, and you know it. A lot of times we're broken. Other people know it, but I say I'm fine, I'm good. And he, the song goes on, the lyrics of the song go on. He, he talks about going to the church. He says, the sign on the door says, come as you are, but I doubt it. Because when we get in here, a lot of times, we don't bring our brokenness. We leave our brokenness at the house. We leave our brokenness at the car. This is a place where brokenness is mended. We're supposed to bring our brokenness here to be mended. Where this is the house of God. This is the church where the community can bring their brokenness to be healed. Where the sick can be can come and to be healed, to be prayed for. I'm just reminded that we can know that victory has been won. The devil is still after us, but victory has already been won. In spite of what we see in this fallen world, there is peace, there is understanding. All of these things are possible when we learn to let go of our truth and be guided by His. The eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, and they were now morally aware, morally discriminant, morally responsible, sexually aware, and aware of their moral experience. Particularly as the awareness of sin would come into the picture. And I believe one of the greatest dangers of our society today is that there are no longer any moral awareness among our people of sin, among our young people, our families, or people in general. And we need a move. We need a, a move of the Spirit among our people from God and by His Spirit to make His presence known. And this begins with His church, seeking Him, praying to Him, and seeking the young church. And one of the other greatest dangers that we face is the lack of awareness of sin among so-called believers. How grave is it that a lot of times we live like the world and the world knows what Scripture says. It's, 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 scripture is just as convenient as this right here. Unbelievers know what Scripture says. 
and they're watching us. They watch the way we live. They want to, they want to know how we're living. And they're watching us and they're like, I don't know if I want to be a part of that. They, they see the church and how the church acts, how the church lives. This is not a ring of heights thing. This is a church thing. The church needs to rise up and repent. And we need to pray for the church today. We need to pray for our community. We need to pray that our nation will rise and be the witness that it needs to be for the world. In their awareness, Adam and Eve, they sewed fig leaves together to clothe themselves because they saw themselves for who they were. In verses 8 through 12, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the, the trees in the garden. How awesome would it be that in the perfection of the garden, God is walking with you. But now, sin has entered the world. The Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, but I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Another danger begins to arise here. The enemy uses this situation to divide individuals and families. And it's a, it's a situation of convenience, of having another person to blame when trouble and accusations come. In verses 8 through 13, the two apparently were aware of their condition. And must have acknowledged this as they heard the sound of the Lord walking. They hid themselves from his presence. In these verses, Adam reveals two excuses. That's what we do. You know, we we sin, we get caught, we come up with an excuse. And it's always somebody else or something else that made us do that. He states, he was responsible. And all he did was respond. Not my fault. She made me do it. It's not my fault. It's, I was just riding along. I didn't. I just, I just happened to be here. Um, Adam's second excuse for his fa- failure is to throw the blame back to God. Well, if you hadn't created her, I wouldn't have ate it. I would just, I've been happy here in the garden by myself. That's, that's his excuse. He blames God. That's what we do. Situations come up in our life, and if God hadn't done this to me, I wouldn't have to be praying to him to take it away. That's what we do. But God allows certain things sometimes to happen. Because he wants us to need him. He wants us to give him glory. Um, He doesn't want sin in our life, but he does want us to praise him. He does want us to give him glory for those things in our life. Eve blames the serpent. The couple deflect their responsibility elsewhere to minimize their disobedience. And we live in a society that is often aware of its wrongdoing, yet refuses to take responsibility for personal action. Rather than accepting responsibility for what one may have done, one attempts to shift blame elsewhere. When it comes to sin before God, all we can have are excuses and guilt. The devil keenly uses this tactic in family marriages, pitting spouses against one another for disobedient behavior that may be revealed. Eve, then Adam, to come to the servant's temptation, be like God. You see, they were looking to go beyond who they were when they took of the fruit. They, they succumbed to the devil's temptation. Because eventually, everyone's going to idolize something. You're going to make up your own truth, and you're going to look to something else to be good, to 
your measure of good is going to shift. Everyone's going to idolize something and have some little g God in your life. People are going to fill their lives with something, even if it's not the one true God in your life. Peter Kreft stated, the opposite of theism is not atheism, it's idolatry. You're going to have something that you keep first in your life. For believers and families today, the imperative is for the one true God to be truly worshipped. Otherwise, Satan will have a chance to insert one of his snares. According to a 2008 study by the Barner Group, take this in. Seven out of ten adults would choose their families above God. Modern families have no sense of provision in their lives, which speaks volumes of the status of faith among adults in the United States today. Seven out of ten. Seventy percent of, of adults would choose their families before they would pick God. Because adults have, no, have so little faith or sense of God's provision, Opportunities for Satan's snares to divide relationships are even greater. His snares entangle, impede, distract from God, and draw one away from serving God. Common snares include worry, anxiousness, laziness, distraction of work, complacency, busyness, idleness. Satan keeps people busy or not busy doing things that are so important and the gospel work is left undone. Satan is bent on tearing down relationships of individual families. And just as Satan crept in on the couple in the garden, the enemy still attacks individuals and especially those in the church today. The enemy is pleased when disobedience to God weakens one's faith and devotion to God. He is busy convincing us, there's plenty of time. We can do that tomorrow. The enemy arms people with faulty truth, worldly thinking, and using various footholds to launch even greater battles to divide people and separate them from God. And just as Adam and Eve did in Genesis 3.12, when one wants to validate one's wrong actions, one will often blame the spouse. Children will blame the parents. Students will blame teachers. For anxieties, worries, personal struggles, and trials of loneliness, rather than taking responsibility for themselves. Colossians, the, the best way to overcome this is to learn to forgive and take responsibility. Colossians 3.13 says, We're to bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also may must forgive. One of the most vulnerable footholds where the enemy attacks is in the area of personal faith, creating personal struggles, preventing growth, and planting seeds of doubt. The enemy will tell you that you are not good enough and not worthy of God. You ever just feel like, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. This is not me. That's what the devil tells you. If you've got the Holy Spirit within you, you're good enough. The devil will tell you that. That's the devil. That's the devil's seed in you. I don't have many times I've, I've been told it. I've been told that in my mind. The devil working in you. The devil will work in that in you and tell you you're not good enough. You're too old. You're too young. Uh, that's, that's that's the devil working in you. In sin, one cannot measure up as we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. There is nothing that we have done on our part to deserve His grace. Romans 3 verses 10 through 12 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. None of us are righteous. There's nothing we've done on our part. Christ did it all. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. He came for us. He came looking for us. All have turned away. They have together 
become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So I ask you today again, who is good? In him we have peace and comfort in knowing our sins are forgiven. And we have the hope of an eternal home in him because of his resurrection, which should encourage and strengthen us to move forward with the commission of Christ that he gave the church. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not, not the, a result of works that anyone should boast. Life is going to have hurdles and unexpected tragedies. To overcome the attacks that one will face from the enemy in this world, this, in this world and within oneself, personal faith must be consistently built up with an awareness of what Satan is coming at you with. Adam and Eve may or may not be been prepared, but maybe she tried to come up with some type of fence, but she was still vulnerable. When one's faith breaks, everything is affected, including career, personal witness, and church life, devotion to God, your children are affected, your spouse, and your marriage itself. This is why it's important to stay connected and to keep others connected because everyone is going to have hurdles and heels. And sometimes people are simply looking for someone to walk with and get over that hurdle or heel. There, there are people that many of us have not seen in years, months. They're, they're broken. And they need to be mended. They need to hear from us. And they need someone to reach out and grab them by the hand and get them over that, that, that hurdle or that heel. And there's no better time than now, as we're coming out of this time of COVID, to bring them back into the storehouse. Because they need someone to walk with them and bring them back into God's house so that we can show them what it means to, to have the love of Christ. The enemy is sowing seeds of false understanding about morality, life, marriage, promoting teachings that are unworthy of God's standard, creating false truths in direct contradiction to his word. To counter the attacks of the enemy, the church and believers must be consistent in, inten in intentionally teaching a biblical perspective of joy and the blessing of God's faithfulness. And one of the best means to counter attacks of the enemy is teaching one another to have an active prayer life. How active is your prayer life? How active is your prayer life among one another? Our prayers should be proactive to counter any attacks individuals or families in our church or family members may be facing. Another way to prepare for attacks, as mentioned earlier, is learning just to forgive. Don't hold grudges. Relationships do not develop strength because two people always agree, but they survive because forgiveness is the glue which will overcome the offenses of this world. Clinton Arnold lists several biblical concepts for Christians dealing with various evils which we all will deal with throughout life. First, he says, we are to draw near to God by submitting oneself to him and our families to God. That comes from James, book of James 4, 7. And we're to do this with genuine desires to seek God's ways. Second, he says, we're to resist the devil and his spirits by giving attention to those areas which make us susceptible to his attacks. Individual families, are to resist the devil by working together in faith. Arnold emphasizes knowing the power one has by Christ that comes simply by renouncing the ungodly things, keeping one from growing in Christ. How do we do this? By working with the Spirit that dwells in us. Romans 8 11 says, We have the same power in us 
that raised uh, that raised Jesus from the dead. How awesome is that to consider? The same power that raised Jesus from the, from the dead dwells in us. And next week, the church celebrates that. The coming of the Holy Spirit is Pentecost. We acknowledge that next week. Take that. You, you have the same power in you that Christ has in him. The third person of the Trinity. He is the one that can move you and can move the church. He is the one moving us. And to overcome the distractions of this world and receive the protection and blessing from God, individuals must devote themselves to God and have a growing awareness of the snares of the enemy and potential pitfalls that, that may cause one to fall. Awareness grows best through discipleship in the local church as churches model what it means to take on the three enemies that each of us have and to face them seriously, along with awareness to the spiritual needs of the local community in fulfilling the Great Commission. It's, it's not just our church. It is the church. It's the church of Christ, and we're to reach out into the community and draw people in. The antidote to self-revision and self-control is ultimately humility. To recognize that our goodness, goodness is His goodness. We humble ourselves. We're thankful for what God has done. We recognize that God is so good. And because He is good, we can be good. So, in the closing verses of chapter 3, I'm not going to read those. In verses 14 through 19, God spoke to those there in the garden. He spoke to the serpent, he spoke to Eve, and then he spoke to Adam. He did not speak to them in a group, but he spoke to them individually. God spoke to each, acknowledging to us that we too bear personal responsibility for sin in our lives. God cursed the serpent and placed enmity between him and the woman. He increased the pain of childbearing in the woman with contrite desires in spite of her husband's position. And to Adam, God cursed him to a life of labor and pain, to toil and work the ground, to have something to eat all the days of his life. Their curse became our curse, and their lack of awareness became our need for awareness, even though we can experience the grace and love of Christ. They did not have the picture of Christ that we have, but we know that there is grace, and there is love, and there is hope because of Christ. Adam and Eve determined their own truth for their own situation, and it led them into sin. We live in a society today where individuals find it casually convenient to determine their own set of facts, their own reality, and their own truth. Yet believe everyone's destination is the same. Everybody's going to heaven. They're not. God is still a God of wrath. As believers, we know that there is only one way, one who provides the truth, and that is Christ that it is Christ who suffered and bled and died for our sins, that we could live in eternity with him. There is a battle that has been raging between God and Satan and his legions ever since the garden. Satan is still fighting to gain souls and influence any lives that he can. But the good news that I can share with you today is that this war has already been won. God set this forth in Genesis 3.15 when he promised that he was going to send him a sign. It was one at the cross and we are just waiting for Christ to call us home. <laughs> Have you experienced this victory today? Do you know what it is to truly know good? Do you know good today? God is so good. 
A.W. Pink said, it was not Adam who saw God, but God who saw Adam. And this has been the order ever since. God is seeking you. God is looking for you. Even if you're saved today, He's looking to dwell in you, in you and to move you. But if you're an unbeliever today, God wants to know you. God wants to know who you are, and He wants to make, draw you to Him eternally. And He's made that way through Christ. So today, as we wind up, we want to recognize God's sovereignty and lordship and the freedom that we once assumed that we had as slaves of sin, and we want to give that to Him. As we come to him in our invitation this morning. I mean, yeah, this morning. Um, I think we've lost our pianist. So, as we go to, to God here before we have our invitation, let's go to God in prayer. And then we'll, we'll sing, we'll just have a, a benediction and we'll sing Amazing Grace. Uh, let's go to God in prayer real quick. Lord, we thank you for. This message, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here this morning, Lord, that needs to hear from you, just to speak with you, Lord, and I just pray that you just move in their hearts, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your message. You are so good, Lord, and Lord, you're just, you're moving among us, God. We just pray that if there's anyone that doesn't know you, Lord, you'll just draw them to you, God. But we thank you for the church, and we just pray that you move among your church, God, among your people. Not just in Rebel Heights, but just among your nations. We're waiting for the day, Lord, when your son comes back, Lord. But until then, help us not to just sit back and wait, but help us to move so that others may know you. Because we see our world, Lord, is chaos, and we just pray that others can be stirred, people will repent. And we just thank you for your church. Lord, as we come together, Lord, we just thank you for all that you're doing in this church and his ministries. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing that amazing grace. Good week. Bless you.